So tonight we're talking about uh, patient assessments. And I was told a few of you before, uh, this is probably one of the more important ones, you know, other than learning the medical stuff, uh, you know, that we're, that we're working on getting into, uh, you know, how we fix problems and how to recognize issues and things like that. Patient assessment, both medical and trauma, uh, is what sets the tone for all that. This is how we gain the information that we need in order to do anything about uh, a problem. So uh, whether somebody's in a car wreck or somebody is found unconscious and we have no idea what's going on, uh, the patient assessment is how we go about getting that. So again, very important that you review this chapter, uh, that you review this recording, the chapter in the book, and that you're looking at, we're, we're going to have several highlighted blocks in here uh, with acronyms. You need to memorize those acronyms. You need to write those acronyms down, have them accessible to you, and try to use them as often as you can. Same thing goes, that's why I told you earlier today <clears throat> about your uh, skill sheets. So your uh, medical and trauma patient assessment skill sheets. If, uh, if you didn't get Rob's uh, message, it's going to be on Canvas under Files. So if you look under, if you go into Canvas, look on the side under Files, and then you'll see your uh, R920. It'll be the uh, that file, and it'll have uh, skill sheet, your National Registry skill sheets, and it also has your class syllabus. Uh, so we'll kind of tell you what's coming up next. If you don't already have that, I would, uh, I would, you know print that out that way you have an idea of what uh what to be looking forward to <clears throat> excuse me so uh, again those are very important that you that you know those skill sheets uh very well uh that's going to be what your patient you you know you're going to be tested on those patient assessments and again it's it's very important that you uh, essentially memorize them uh you need to go through there and check those um you know, work through each one as we start getting into different medical problems, start taking those medical problems and, and using that patient assessment to uh, to go through it. <clears throat> All right, so. So scene size up is, you know, kind of where everything starts at. Actually, you know, it starts with the call. So even our patient assessment kind of starts with the dispatch. The information that we get from dispatch helps kind of set the tone. We're starting to go through that mental patient assessment in our head and working through what our potential problem is going to be, what how we can work with it, what tools we have to fix that. You know, those types of things. Again, we have to just be fluid thinkers, okay? We can't just go, oh, that's what we're dispatched to. We get there, oh, dang, you know, I don't know what to do now, okay? We have to be able to flip that uh, pretty quick and, and go a different direction. So scene management, you know, impact of the environment on patient care. You know, I mean, especially in this area of the country, we deal with people who are in tree stands and in the woods and, you know, we don't have a, a ton of high rise buildings that we're having to worry with. Uh, but again, those are things that we, you know, you can still see that in some of these urban areas where uh, we're dealing with uh, with a patient who is, uh, you know, in some type of uh, urban area as well. So addressing hazards, we're always looking for, for things that might hurt us, uh, any potential violence that might come our way. The need for special additional or specialized resources. First thing right off the bat, and if you look at if you look at your those patient assessments, it uh, like right the number four or five down. Request additional EMS assistance if necessary. Okay, so it's pretty high up on the list. We need to make sure that we are uh, addressing the need for that early, and then go ahead and call for it uh, early. That way we can start and get some help there as soon as possible, and not having to wait uh, till later. Standard precautions is going to be your uh, number one thing, and that those standard precautions are your uh, gloves, gowns, mask, you know, anything type, any any type of PPE issues that we might need. Uh, and as you can see it, it on your skill sheet, it's on the very top. It's the very first thing. 
So we walk in there, we do an examinations, and it's, uh, you know, BSI is the scene safe, right? So body substance isolation equipment is on. I have my gloves. I have my face mask or whatever it might be, and, uh, and I'm, I'm making sure that my scene is safe, right? Those two things we need to make sure of right off the bat. <clears throat> so primary assessment for both adult uh, for both medical and trauma and now we we, we kind of use these separately because there's just certain things we have to do differently for trauma now we may have a trauma patient who also has a medical problem and vice versa right so we have to um we kind of have to look at what's worse and kind of go with that assessment first and then uh and then we can we can kind of work work down each one of them and make sure that we're we're touching each one uh, kind of in the secondary assessment. But on the primary assessment, we're really still looking for the main things. Level of consciousness, you know, are they with it or not? Uh, ABCs, are they breathing? Do they have a pulse? You know, do they have an open airway? You know, all th those three main things are, are key for both, uh, you know, medical and trauma. Identifying any life threat. So again, if we have massive hemorrhaging, do we have any, you know, uh, major issues, you know, to the airway? <clears throat> uh, is there, you know, a swarm of bees around this person? They have some kind of bee allergy or whatever. They might, you know, uh, you know, any number of things that might uh, threaten their life, right? So, is a car about to roll over on them? Are they, you know, is a light pole about to fall on the car? You know, all these different things we need to you know, be cognizant of, right? Assessment of vital functions. So. We talked a little bit about vital signs before. We'll talk about them, you know, throughout this class. And it's important that we, uh, you know, get a quick round of vitals and see where what we're working with. Okay. So kind of, and that will also help lead us down a path. I'm gonna, and you're going to hear me say that multiple times, especially on the medical side. If you look at the medical patient assessment, there's multiple headers there. Uh, once we get down to uh, that primary survey, I'm sorry, the uh, yeah, the primary survey, excuse me, secondary assessment. Once we get down to the secondary assessment on the patient, uh, medical patient assessment, you see it has uh, cardiovascular, pulmonary, neuro neurological, musculoskeletal, integumentary, GI, GU, reproductive, psycho psychosocial, psychological, psychological. Those are, those are kind of the lanes that we're going to end up picking okay so with when we look at these things when we look at these types of uh initial initial assessment factors those are going to be the things that help decide what lane that we travel down medically okay um you know the interventions that we do are going to be those that are really more on the life preservation side of the house it's not going to necessarily be uh any minor stuff just yet we're kind of we're going to take care of the bad stuff first right we're going to make sure that they have airway breathing circulation uh that we take care of any of those life threats you know any any level of consciousness issues we can we can do that and uh and try to get them to ensure that they're not going to die on us, die on us anytime soon right so that's what we want to work on first so the big part about this this whole thing, being be an EMR, being an EMT, paramedic, any of that stuff, being a nurse, any of that is bedside manner, okay? <clears throat> being able to go into, into a stranger's house at 3 a.m. or, or you know, going up to their car at 3 a.m. in the cold rain and trying to get all this information out of them in a manageable format that helps you as a provider uh, do a good job at, at, get, at doing patient care, but also helps keep your patient calm, uh, understanding what you're doing, what you're saying, all that sort of stuff. You know, that's a that's a big deal, and it's not necessarily easy for everyone. Uh, it's kind of like public speaking. It, it's it's very similar to that. Most people just aren't comfortable standing in front of a group of people and talking uh, about anything. Um, so, uh, especially strangers. So when you're doing that, again, three in the morning in some stranger's house um, and you're trying to get all this information and they either have a decreased level of consciousness or they're just pissed off at the world and don't want to talk to you, uh, you know, any number of factors, uh, it's it's challenging. OK, so 
um, you know, when you're trying to get history, we're all we're talking about recent history. OK, a lot of times they're going to want to tell you air. Er, some some patients are going to tell you everything and some patients aren't going to want to tell you anything. All right. They may not have been the one who called the family member called the wife, the husband called and they don't want to go to the hospital. They don't want the fire department or the EMS to come and uh, and they could care less. All right. So some of them are defiant. They will not. They, they could get out of my house. Leave me alone. I don't want to talk to you. You know, things like that. So, and some just have to be coaxed a little bit. They just have to be softened up and, and, and warmed up to, and usually it's, it's okay. Very small percentage are very persistent. So the biggest thing, if we can get out of them is that chief complaint, right? And, and one of the ways that we can do that is why are we here today? Now, again, depending on the patient, sometimes they, they go, well, so, so, uh, you know, why, why did you call us or why are we here today? And usually you'll get, well, I don't want you here. They called, you know, or something like that. Right. So you kind of have to watch what you say, how you say it, or listen, you know, listen to your dispatch information and see, you know, if they say, uh, you know, the male subject is, you know, uh, passed out on the front porch and his, and his, uh, his wife called 911 or whatever. Right. So if uh, <clears throat> you hear stuff like that, that's probably not the best way to go about, you know, asking that question. You know, the biggest thing that I do is, is, uh, is I ask them, Hey, you know, just what's going, it's like a conversation, right? What's going on with you? Hey, what's, what's up with you, man? What's going on? You know, and it's really just, you know, a friendly, you know, as friendly as you possibly can uh, conversation starter, right? We walk up, people are sitting there, laying there, whatever, hand on the chest, hand on the head, breathing, breathing heavy, anything like that. And we're just asking them, hey, what's going on with you today? And a lot of times they go, oh, my chest hurts. Okay. All right. Chief complaint is chest pain. You know, that's generally how that works. You know, you get some that are, you know, want to be comedians and they want to, they, they want to pick and play too. And, you know, you'll get some kind of, you know, uh, you know, maybe joking type response or whatever. And so you have to go, well, I, I know, I know you're here. I know we're here because your dog ate, you know, your dog ate your lunch or whatever, but, um, but not really like what, you know, tell me, tell me, are you hurting somewhere? Are you, you know, you feeling dizzy? Like what's going on with you? Tell, tell me why we're here. And, um, or tell me why they called or tell me why you called, you know, something like that. And that, that usually will kind of draw them into, Hey, this is kind of serious. I need you to, I need you to, to give me the, the actual, thing right <clears throat> so again it's a fine line between being rude and you know not being rude and being direct so you don't want to be a robot that's one of the worst things you can do is just try to you know read off a checklist type thing even though this you have a checklist here and, and i'm telling you to memorize it but that's so that you can get the whole thing down in your head but when it comes out between you and the patient it needs to be like hey man what's going on with you today bud everything all right it needs to sound like that. Okay. Now, again, we mentioned this before. When they give you a response back of, oh, man, my chest hurts. I'm not real sure. You know, I, I, I woke me up right out of a dead sleep and things like, you know, when they say that, what have we just done on the assessment side of it? Open airway has a pulse. Okay. Um, you know, we've also established a chief complaint, right? Um, you know, so if you look at, if you're looking at your, your checklist here, we've gone down, I mean, almost three quarters, a quarter of the page, right? So other than, uh, other than getting vital signs and, and a sample history, we're, we're almost to a secondary assessment, you know, with a couple questions, right? So it's all in how you do it, how you, how you develop that rapport, uh, right off the bat. Building trust is another one. So especially with kids, um, you know, and people who are, you know, having psycho psychological issues, things like that. It really is. It really pays to be uh, unintimidating, you know, calm, you know, nonchalant type thing and working your way through these through these questioning without sounding like you're interrogating them. OK, so the other big one is on the trauma side is mechanism of injury, MOI. So how did this injury take place okay 
On the medical side, it's nature of illness or NOI. So we want to we want to develop those two things as soon as possible. All right, that's going to help tell us a good bit about how this came to be. So is the MOI, is it because of, an, of a vehicle accident? You know, where they hit by a car, they fall off a bike, you know, that they slip on the stairs, uh, they cut their hand with a knife while they're washing dishes. You know, those are all mechanisms of injury, how the injury came to be. All right. Um, nature of illness. And those are, again, on the medical side, it can be a little bit more complex, maybe a little bit more long term in, in nature. So it's uh, it's still it's one of those things where generally the first thing if somebody says, you know, what's our my chief complaint is all oh, my chest is hurting. And then I'm asking them right off the bat, right off the bat. Well, have, have you ever had a uh, have you ever had a heart attack before? Or what were you doing? And that's generally. Uh, that's generally where I'm going to get that nature of illness. So, um, you know, they've, it's something that's happened before it's reoccurring or they were doing something. I was mowing the grass outside on a push mower and it was 95 degrees. All right. Pretty stressful on the heart doing that when you're 75 years old. So <clears throat> those are things that, uh, that we want to try to know. And there's a way that we're going to go down this history taking path here in just a second. Uh, and again, one of these acronyms. So associated signs and symptoms, if you walk up, and again, a sign is something that you can see, right? Just like a street sign, we can see a street sign. So a symptom is something that they tell us, they give us, or the family or friend or whoever, bystander, gives us that they uh, were saying that they felt like or that they presented with. So those signs and symptoms, again, could be anything, could be uh, any number of um uh, of issues. So on the signs part, again, we're looking for skin color, condition, sweating, uh, bleeding, you know, uh, foaming at the mouth, you know, bleeding from the ears, you know, uh, any number of things like that, right? It's things that we can actually physically see from the outside. And again, those symptoms are any number of things, stomach ache, shoulder pain, uh, chest pain, and we're going to get into how to evaluate those symptoms as we go along. So the secondary assessment, uh, again, is after we've kind of made sure that the main things are good, okay, and during that primary assessment, now we want to start nitpicking a little bit, right? We want to get a little bit deeper, okay? The secondary assessment, and especially for those of you who work in rural areas, uh, when the ambulance just doesn't show up in 15 minutes or 10 minutes, okay, this is where a lot, this is where it's your time to shine. Okay, is the is doing a good secondary assessment, performing a rapid full body scan, uh, especially for uh, trauma patients, but also for medical patients. Hey, does it hurt here? Does it hurt there? You know, do you, do you can you feel my me touching you here and there? Uh, focus assessment of pain. If they tell you something hurts, you know, we're going to assess that. And again, we're going to get in that a little bit later. But these are things that we want to know. We're going to start digging deeper into how bad is the pain on a scale from one to 10, 10 being the worst pain you've ever felt. What would you say that pain is? And, um, and kind of digging deeper into that location, things of that nature, right? Assessment of vital signs. Again, we're going to check those vital signs and make sure that we uh, have a good understanding uh, and a trend. Okay. A trending vital sign uh, helps us give, give a, the next provider an idea of where this patient started at and where they were in the middle and then now where they are that now that we're passing off patient care also later on that may tell them something um in in the in the er to tell the doctor a little bit more about uh what was maybe what was happening at the same time so we don't have the monitor to give us all these vital signs so we have to give kind of a basic understanding of of, of again and, and taking a blood pressure taking a pulse taking a resp respiratory rate are 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 big uh factors you know so they tell the right person they tell them a whole lot right they, more than more than me and you uh they they kind of cut through a, a lot of things they can see a lot with just those numbers so <clears throat> it's very important to go ahead and try to get a, a round of vitals as soon as you can 
uh, and uh, and then every every five minutes or so afterwards, that way we can uh, we can put it on a trending scale and see how it changes. So, like I said, EMRs are usually the first ones to the scene. Uh, a lot of times they're before you know before the ambulance, and uh, and again, it's important that we that we get there and try to do that scene size up. You know, try to get that mechanism of injury established. How did it happen? Mechanism, uh, uh, nature of illness. Uh, perform that primary assessment. Do a quick scan. Make sure all the life threats are taken care of. Making sure we're not, you know, the patient's not going to die anytime soon. Obtain the patient's medical history. Perform a secondary assessment, and then perform that reassessment. You know, about every five minutes or so. So this this framework again tell, helps us to have a have a guideline to to go with. You know, again, patients kind of will give you a whole. Sometimes will give you their life story right up front. They've been in the hospital numerous times. They've been have been through EMS encounters numerous times, and they know the answer to all your questions. And they'll just tell it to you. And so you almost have to kind of keep up. You know, they're just like, hey, kid, come on, keep up. I, uh, you know, I don't have all day. I want to go to the hospital. Right. So they'll just give you everything, all their medicines, all their history, you know, the doctor's names and, you know, just everything, all the stuff. Right. So uh, you kind of just have to start putting it in order, you know, going back and, 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 and making sure that you're not uh, you're not missing stuff. So uh, big thing, safely approach an, an emergency scene. And like we said before, you know, things that can hurt you are also things that can hurt your patient, right? So, but we want to be, want to be looking and making sure that those things aren't, aren't a life threat to us uh, or our patient. Determine the need for additional help. We talked about that. Examine the patient to determine if the injury, if, if injuries or illness are present. Uh, you know, again, if you walk up and somebody's sitting there looking you in the face and able to, you know, talk and explain things you know again we have a lot of answers we have a lot of questions that have been answered already just by doing that okay uh obtain the patient's medical history we're going to talk more about that in a second report the results to other ems personnel so typically we do that during that transfer of care we typically don't get on the radio and do a whole lot of that unless the patient is uh, a pretty serious uh patient whether it's injury or illness and the ambulance has got a little bit of a lag time. So we try to start getting that information out to the ambulance as soon as we can so they can start to make provisions, uh, you know, for maybe calling a helicopter or alerting a trauma surgeon or alert, alerting some other type of specialty, specialist at the hospital to be on, on standby, you know, those types of things. So the other big thing, especially on accidents and, and any, any type of trauma stuff, is number of people involved. Um, you know, that's, you know, we talk about location of the incident obviously is important, main problem or type of incident. But uh, we also need to know how many people we have involved. And that's one of the reasons why if you ever listen to the radio, uh, you know, fire department radio, uh, law enforcement radio, something like that, you know, we're asking them, hey, how many people, you know, were affected, how many people were in the vehicle, that sort of stuff. And you, dispatch is usually pretty good about trying to get those things for you. Uh, but sometimes the scene evolves over over a few minutes and your initial caller uh, may not give you, may not know all the facts. Okay. So it's, it's, it's a good idea, especially if you have a little bit of a longer response time. You know, if you've been traveling for a few minutes, you know, hey, you got an update, hear any more about any different, any more patients or anything like that. Other factors, again, time of day, day of the week, weather conditions. So if it's freezing cold rain and it's, you know, two in the morning and we're going to a wreck on the interstate, we got we got a bunch of safety factors to be thinking about, right? So right off the bat, we know that we're going to have some issues. And so that could be anything from traveling to and from. That could be just be uh, loading our patient up and getting them up a hill. You know, it's going to be maybe slippery and icy and, uh, you know, just working outside you know, when it's really, really cold. 
is going to be uh, challenging. And, and again, same thing. Um, you know, it's, it was hot not too long ago, so it, uh, it doesn't take much and you're out there sweating to death, um, trying to cut somebody out of a car or, or anything like that. Uh, try to mentally prepare for the situations you may find when you arrive on the scene. Like you said, when, uh, you know, we get dispatched to a multi-vehicle incident, we got multiple people that are deceased. Uh, we have children that are involved and all these other different types of things that kind of weigh on you a little bit. Uh, you know, it's best to just go ahead and, and say, all right, well, I, I know that the, this is a high probability that I'm going to encounter these things and I'm going to go ahead and make sure that I'm going to check them first, make sure that they are, uh, you know, absolutely, you know, a hundred percent deceased. And then we're going to go and, and take care of the people, the patients that are viable that I can save, you know, and then focus on that. And that's kind of the best way to go about it is get those people out of the way and, um, you know, and make sure that they're, they are in fact deceased. And then we'll go ahead and, and, and focus on the, the issues that we can actually do something about. <clears throat> so again, we work with um, work with a lot of different agencies uh, all over, just depending on who you, where you're at and who you're working with. But uh, there's you know law enforcement and other EMS crews potentially, uh, fire departments, you know public safety entities, rescue teams, all sorts of different stuff that you may encounter. Um, you know, especially down here for those you know everybody pretty much is from down here, so uh, you know we could have. If we would have if we would have gotten the the impact from uh, Sally that Orange Beach got, we would we would be in their shoes right now, and we would have teams from Alabama, teams from Louisiana, teams from you know Ohio, probably Illinois, stuff like that that are down here, you know, working with us, and we saw that during Katrina. And we had tons of different agencies from all over the country that were down here for a week, two weeks at a time and uh, and were integrated with us. And so we had and so we were working with them. And um, and so whenever we do that, it's always it's always good to try to um, you know be ready to to kind of go back and forth with these different uh, agencies and, and let them let them do their part. Uh, but all, it needs to be some uh, kind of a unified type command system and and work with each other to to make sure that this incident gets taken care of safely. Uh, a big one for like vehicle accidents, uh, but it could be, you know, especially when we're dealing with traffic uh, or it could be just be somebody, you know, sick that's just wandered out in the roadway. Right. It could be anything like that. It doesn't have to be an actual vehicle accident, but using our vehicle, whatever the vehicle it might be, fire truck, police car, ambulance, you know, POV, whatever it is. Uh, if it's if you're the first one there, let's try to use our vehicle as a kind of a blocker to ensure. To ensure that. Um, that you're not going that you're not taking the or you're not putting everybody in danger and then we can kind of protect each other. The, um, can everybody hear me? Yeah, we hear you now. Okay. What'd y'all miss? Hey, what did you, what did you, what was, what was the last thing you guys heard? We heard, um, about the teams in Orange Beach. Okay. All right. So was there something before that y'all, you guys missed? Okay. Cut out when you're talking about the teams. Okay. All right. Good deal. I just, I seen something pop up on my screen and I thought it might've lost connection there. I was going to make sure. All right, so just talking about traffic management, things of that nature, just making sure that you're using whatever emergency vehicle that you're in as a blocker to help protect the scene. Uh, scan the scene. You know, we're looking as we're pulling up, we're looking at that that window view or that, that windshield view of, of the scene and looking for anything that we might need to be concerned about. Again, you may have people laid out in the street. You may have, you know, people staggering, walking around, uh, again, down power lines, uh, you know, any, any number of things like that. So we're kind of starting to take a, a mental note of all these different things that we're seeing just through the windshield, let alone when we get out and actually do a full scene survey.
So same thing, we're looking for visible hazards, crash or crime scene, you know, electrical wires, traffic, gasoline, unstable buildings, surfaces, weather, crowds, any number of things that, that are possible. So uh, there's all sorts of different things out there. You know, electricity is one of those that we can't really see it very much. Sometimes you get an arcing line or something like that, but nonetheless, it's usually... Uh, you know, kind of hanging out there on the side or, or, you know, down in the bushes or something like that. And so just be really careful about those types of things and, and really do a good, you know, scan uh, of where you're at before you start walking up on stuff like that. Biologic hazards, <clears throat> hazardous materials, poisonous fumes, you know, don't get so tunnel vision that you, uh, that you miss stuff and that you are, um, that you're going in there blind. Okay. Uh, really try to keep an open open mind about what might be happening here, and uh, and that's another thing too. Trying to ask dispatch, hey, what what do we have on scene? What kind of vehicles are involved? If it's a freight truck, especially, uh, you know, what type of uh, cargo are they carrying? You know, any any of these things are, are helpful. Uh, you know, it, it's unfortunate and it happens sometimes, but sometimes we have to say, hey, we're we're not. Uh, we're not going to go in there until we have some help. Okay. And, uh, you know, it's unfortunate for patient care and things like that, but you know, if, if something happens to you, then there won't be anybody to help the patient. So, uh, again, recognize these things early, get the right people in route early and let's take care of it as soon as we can so that we can get in there or that we can get the patients out and, um, and start treating them. So we talked about MOI and NOI, and again, those are those are big pieces of the puzzle. We want to know what happened before this, or how, what caused this to happen, so that we can um, we can start to go and pick that path. Uh, if you look there at the bottom, it says, "Do not rule out any injury without conducting a full body physical assessment." Uh, again, this is another one in trauma where people start to see a lot of blood coming from somewhere or they see a big broken bone or something like that and they focus in on it and they, they miss all sorts of stuff. So it's very important that, especially in trauma, but even in medical, we're doing a full, a full body exam, a full physical exam. Uh, we're rolling them over. We're looking at their back, their buttocks, back, their legs, their feet, uh, you know, armpits, back of the neck you know, under behind the ears, all these different types of things. You can be shot. You can be shot in the head and not know it. Okay. Uh, adrenaline, uh, you know, just any number of, you know, alcohol on board, drugs on board, any number of factors can dull your senses and, and, and your patient may not tell you that anything hurts. So I don't feel anything or whatever. Uh, you know, a lot of gunshot wounds, especially stab wounds, are small. They're very small. They're not gigantic holes, you know, in your body. Um, and so, and they don't necessarily all bleed. So it, it's it's very easy to miss things. So having a good flashlight, especially even, even during the daylight, going into a dark house, a dark trailer, you know, vehicle, any number of things like that, uh, you're going to need some more light. So a good flashlight or headlamp is good uh, to really shine some light on on some of these um, on the rest of the body, that, and then we can you know rule out any other injuries or illnesses. Again, we talked about standard precautions. Always have gloves ready. You know that's just a just a, a big deal. Uh, you know you'll see some some medics walk up with no gloves on, and um, and a lot of times they just it depends on the patient, you know, if it's a psych patient, they don't have gloves on. They're really not, they're really not looking to do a whole lot of actual physical exam. Uh, but you may see them put them on before they actually start to do stuff like that. So again, if, if you see people with, with a bad habit of just not putting it on at all, uh, don't follow that lead. Obviously it's just, you know, it's just a good idea to always have some gloves, a couple pairs of gloves on you, you know, in, in your, in your pockets or whatever, that way, if you're walking, walking away if you have multiple patients and you're you're kind of separated from a bag or separated from the ambulance or anything like that you'll have a couple pairs on you that way if you get your hands really bloody you can take them off put new gloves on go to another patient that sort of thing
So again, that primary assessment, like we mentioned, is uh, is key to uh, to ensuring that we don't uh, we don't have any issues with uh, with life threats. And the patient sex and approximate age, you know, again, it's one of those things we're we're not picking on anybody. We're not uh, we're not trying to get into any geopolitical, you know. Uh, bias or whatever for male, female, gender roles, all the new stuff that's kind of out there in this day and age, you know, if it's one of those things where it's a male looks like a female, a female looks like a male, you know, if you have a question about it, you, you know, female with an Adam's apple, you know, it, these types of things are, it's important to just be nice about it. Maybe be a little more quiet. Hey, um, you know, what would you like, what's your, what's your name and call them by their name instead of sir or ma'am, um, you know, and uh, what they like to be called. But then at some point we're going to need to know, I need to know your legal name. I need to know your actual legal name. And then I need to know what your legal gender is, you know? So again, some people could, you know, could cause an uproar about it, right? You just have to be as sensitive as possible. Understand that this is, I'm, I'm not, not trying to be rude, I, but this is something that we need to have, um, you know, for, for medical reasons at the hospital, you know, this is why I need this information. It's, you know, it's not going to go past that. <clears throat> so talking about assessing level of consciousness or level of responsiveness. Um, again, we, like we've mentioned in the legal section, we need to, we need to be really sure that our patient is able to, to, uh, make decisions for their self. Okay. And this is one of the ways that we go about doing that. So it's good, like I said before, to introduce yourself. Hey, I'm, I'm Justin with the fire department. I'm here to help you. Um, tell me what's going on today. What's happening? You know, uh, why, why are we called? Why are, you know, why'd you call us? You know, things like that. And let them know that, Hey, we're just here to help. You know, what's, what's, tell me what's, tell me what's going on so we can get you some help. All right. So we kind of, we can use this scale, uh, again, a very rudimentary scale uh, called the AVPU scale, and it's just an acronym. And it stands for four different things, okay? It stands for the patient, once we walk up to, we talk to the patient, and the patient is alert, okay? Alert just means that their their eyes open, they look at you, they respond to you, that sort of thing, okay? That's alert. Now there's different levels of alertness. Okay, somebody might be alert, but so like kind of like the lights are on but nobody's home. If you ever heard that, so yeah, oh well, yeah, they're alert. They they can walk around. They can run a marathon. They can look at you dead in the face and blink their eyes and move their head and everything else, but they're not they're not doing a whole lot. Okay, uh, so the other one is verbal. Um, verbal means that they're not responding to verbal stimulus. So if I if I walk up and I go, hey, hey, Johnny, Johnny, hey, and you get nothing, or, or, or and then they then they wake up, or they when then they open their eyes, then they look at you, then they are uh, responsive to verbal stimulus. Okay, so if it takes you yelling at them to get them to wake up, then it's verbal stimulus. Okay, that's that's their responsive level is verbal. Pain is the same thing. If I yell and yell, they still don't wake up and I pinch their foot, you know, I put my, maybe put a little pressure down on their sternum with my knuckle. Okay. Roll it around, cause a little bit of discomfort. And that causes them to wake up only. It takes me having to create some type of pain for them to wake up. Then they have a painful stimulus. They're responsive to painful stimulus. So if you walk up, they're not alert. They don't respond to verbal or painful stimulus. They're unresponsive. Okay. So very simple. Uh, you know, just four steps. So, if, you know, you, paramedic walks up and part of your assessment is, hey, we got Mr. Jimmy here. He's 79 years old. Uh, he's been, uh, you'll hear, you'll hear me say he's been, he's alert and oriented times zero. Okay. He's unconscious. Right. So that lets them know that he um, if he's 
if it's if he's alert alert and oriented times four, then he's alert, right? If he's uh, alert and oriented times three or two or one, you know, then uh, then we're kind of working our way back down the scale. Again, that's just me. You don't have to use that, uh, but you can just say he's only alert. He's alert to verbal stimulus. Okay, that lets them know that hey, he's kind of out of it, but he's still just kind of you know he still will you know, aroused to, to us, uh, speaking to him again, same thing. We tell him, Hey, he's, he's, uh, he's only responsive to pain and, uh, you know, had to do a sternal rub on him. And they, that again, tells him, Hey, he's a little bit, a little bit farther along in his, in his consciousness. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. So again, the reason for the response of the, for the lack of responsiveness, lack of consciousness, could be any number of things. Can everybody hear me? Can everybody hear me? Yeah, we got you. We lost you for a little bit, but we got you. Okay. So y'all y'all understand that Apu scale? Y'all y'all got that part? Yes. Okay, good deal. All right, so the rapid exam, the uh performing that rapid exam, like I said, during that initial during that primary assessment is is very important. In that we are, like I said, kind of going really quick to make sure that we don't have anything that's going to cause our patient to die on us anytime soon. So assessing the airway, like we talked about before uh, in that airway section, uh, making sure that we have a good open patent airway, that their chest is rising and falling. There's no foreign body or, or uh, blood or b bodily fluids in the, in the airway. And if we need to, we may have to clear the airway out, right? We talked about suctioning. Make, you know, for only 15 seconds, going in there, 15 seconds in and out and clearing the airway. Um, you know, maybe if it's a choking patient, we're having to do um, chest compressions to, to try to, you know, alleviate that. Or using an airway adjunct. We talked about, um, you know, oral airways, nasal airways, any number of things that like that that we may need to use to keep that airway open <clears throat> excuse me breathing is the other one like i said we want to make sure that chest is rising and falling uh that they have a good respiratory rate so they're breathing they're breathing at an appropriate rate for their age um you know if their patient's unconscious we'll you know try to look listen and feel making sure like i said we can see that rise and fall of the chest look looking and feeling for breath uh on the side of our face listening for anything and again, if we don't we don't have that, we're gonna go right into rescue breathing. One breath every three to, every one breath every five seconds, and um, and we'll do that until they start breathing, or we have a higher level of care there that can intubate or something like that. So circulation on, on your rapid exam, again checking the carotid pulse up there in the neck, making sure and and see if they have a pulse. Um, if they do have a pulse, that's great. Uh, we will also want to assess the radial pulse down in the arm, and that will help kind of to give us an idea of if they have enough pressure in the system to pump the blood down to the wrist like that in the radial pulse, that tells us that they usually have a blood pressure, a systolic blood pressure of at least 80. Okay, so that helps us to kind of just a quick little, you know, assessment tool to say, okay, they have a pulse in the wrist, their heart is pumping well enough to get it out there. Okay, if you have a serious issue with the pump, whether it's electrical or mechanical, um, and you don't have a pul pulse in the wrist, then, you know, that's that's going to be, it's going to kind of start telling the tale, hey, something's going on here, there's an issue and and it's the pump's not pumping well enough to get it down to the rest of the body okay skin color and condition uh and temperature these uh these are, again are things that help help us to identify 
uh, issues going on. So uh, things like dehydration or again, just, you know, issues with the, with, with flow, with um, systemic blood flow. So if the, if the body is pale, ashy color, things like that, those things are going to kind of stand out and you'll be able to see that as a sign, right? So we talked about signs and symptoms. This would be a sign that we can kind of see uh, if they're sweating. Okay. Uh, you know, these are again, things that are usually indicative, especially when you get in a cardiac, when you have somebody who is cool, clammy and diaphoretic, diaphoretic, diaphoretic or diaphoresis is just a big word for sweating. So, if we have those that combination of things with chest pain, that kind of gives us an idea of they're probably having a heart attack. Okay. So again, important, you know, little things like that, and you can kind of put together, string together and go, hey, one, two, three, four, add them up, not good. Okay. And we can start to kind of again go down uh, that path of maybe cardiac in that case, right? So again, carotid artery in the neck, radial artery in the wrist. So talking about skin color and condition a little bit more, uh, I'll talk about pale. It's the whitish uh, indicating decreased circulation to that part of the body. Normally uh, in the Caucasians, it would be, you know, uh, more of a pink color. Uh, even those that are have a little bit more of a tan. Uh, you still you still see that um, that color of the skin uh, for African Americans. It, it would be more of an ashy type color. We can also look at again people of uh, uh, darker skin color that have uh, on their nail beds. We'll look and see uh, what their uh, capillary refill is, and we'll get on the capillary refill a little bit, but more or less that the blood is actually getting down there uh, to it, and also the the inside of the mouth. So flush would be reddish, indicating excess excessive uh, circulation to that part of the body. Uh, blue is uh, also referred to as cyanotic, indicating lack of oxygen and possible airway problems. Okay, so if we're not getting a good enough oxygenated blood uh, to the body, a lot of times you'll kind of it'll kind of turn blue. Another reason why a lot of these pictures that you see showing blood vessels and heart. Uh, uh, portions of the heart and you have blue and red for oxygenated and, and deoxygenated and this is one of those reasons why um, that kind of goes in there to help reinforce that so deoxygenation usually comes out as blue oxygenated is red or dark red so yellow would indicate uh, liver problems we refer to that as jaundice jaundice okay that yellow tint to the skin uh, and then, of course, you have just kind of normal skin color, depending on the the race uh, or ethnicity of the patient. So it's always good to update uh, EMS or responding EMS units. Again, like I said, if uh, if it's you know kind of a minor issue, you know, light breathing problem, or you know, uh, just um, you know somebody who's having uh, anxiety or something like that, you know, just some type of light, you know, some of these light issues. It's not necessary to just get on the radio and give a full report, uh, especially on the fire and EM, a fire and law enforcement side. <clears throat> the ambulance is not going to do that uh, until they get close to the hospital, uh, like literally just within a few miles of the hospital. Then they'll give their report to the hospital and uh, and let the hospital know what they have uh, coming in. Um, if it is if it is a again a serious patient you know, absolutely, you know, get, get a good concise report, write it down, say it out loud first, and then get on the radio and say it. Okay. Um, that way everything kind of runs together smoothly and everybody understands what you're saying. Clear, concise, just the main things about what's going on with the patient. So again, investigate that chief complaint. Uh, you know, we, we can start to get into once you have command of this history taken, you know, process, then you can kind of feel comfortable about bouncing around a little bit. Um, and it, it's it's really does kind of uh, it, again, it takes 
you have to know it in your head like a robot, but you don't you just don't want it to come out like a robot. OK, so don't allow uh, don't allow a conscious patient's comments to distract you. Like I said, they will usually talk your head off or not say anything at all. So both of both of which are a challenge sometimes. You know, sometimes you just have to tap on the shoulder and go, hey, Miss Smith. Ma hey, ma'am, 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 ma'am. Just hang on a second. I, I I understand what you're saying, and I appreciate all this information, but I just need to know, did you take your blood sugar medicine? You know, did you take that today or not? You know, and, and kind of start getting back on track, okay? And because um, she'll be telling you about her daughter's blood sugar medicine, and she took blood sugar medicine in 1978. You know, I mean, just going on and on about all sorts of stuff. And, uh, well, let me tell you, but well, hang on, let me tell you. No, well, no just – and so sometimes you have to let them talk a little bit and don't be rude and then try to work your way back in into the uh, the process. So gathering that systemic account of the past medical conditions, illnesses, injuries um, are, are important. And again, like I said, we're going to get into um, a, a, an acronym here called SAMPLE uh, that helps you kind of do that, helps kind of break that down. So determines the events leading up to the present medical condition and determine the signs and symptoms of the current condition. <clears throat> and again, all these things were as they say it, okay, well, you're you are um you're having chest pain. Okay, what what you know, where's the chest pain at? How bad is the chest pain? Right. So we're kind of clarifying questions. So we're getting we're getting some information, and then we're gonna clarify that information. Right. So it makes either makes sense to you. It's going to make sense to the next person. So we try to get we try to do that in clear, systematic manner. Like I said, we're not trying to op do open ended questions that we're going to have them just rambling on about all the stuff that they've ever had going wrong with them. Um, you know, we want to try to get something that specifically talks about what's going on with them right now. And. um any major, like I said, relevant, serious injuries, illnesses, surgeries, you know, medicines, uh, if it's over-the-counter medicine, if it's if it's excessive or if it's consistent over-the-counter medicine, um, you know, allergies to any medicines, foods, seasonal allergies, you know, those types of things are important, right, because we may have to give them some medicine, and so we want to know if they have any allergies to that. So this is what I'm getting at here is uh, – is the sample history, and this is we've already kind of touched on these things, uh, but this is absolutely 110% something that I use till this day all the time. I'm saying it in my head, I'm writing it down. Okay, it may I may jump around these things just because the patient gives me certain information first, but absolutely 110% important that you do this. Okay, um, this it, that you know this the sample. Okay. So if you haven't already done it, you need to write it down, all right? So the S start, stands for signs and symptoms. We mentioned that earlier, right? So what do I see? What will they tell me about it, okay? So if they will tell you, well, how do you feel? What's going on? Well, uh, I have chest pain, and, uh, you know, my jaw kind of hurts, and my, my, my arm hurts up top, and, you know, okay, those are symptoms, right? Those are symptoms. These are things that the patient are telling you. But I see that they're, he's kind of, clammy and you know his color's gone and he's sweating okay these are signs so i picked up on those signs right so i'm notating these things i'm either in my mind or on a piece of paper i'm notating that so the next thing i want to you know kind of go down and go all right so mr smith are you uh are you allergic to anything or, or i usually ask them, are you allergic to any medicine I used to do, I used to say, hey, are, are you allergic to anything? And, you know, sometimes they would be like, oh, I'm allergic to my wife. And, you know, and so it would just open up the door for all sorts of stuff. Okay. So um, when I, when I do that, it's usually, hey, are, you know, are you allergic to any medicine? And, and that would typically bring out, yeah, I'm allergic to codeine. I'm allergic to, you know, um, you know, to, you know, certain types of foods or, or bee stings and, you know, stuff like that. Right. So, so we notate those things. 
medications. All right. What medications is the patient taking? Uh, and typically we ask about prescription medications. So what prescription medicines are you on? And do you have any, do you take any over the counter medicine on a regular basis? You know, or I ask them what, what, what medicine do you take on a regular basis? And that usually will bring out, well, I take, you know, uh, Pepsi for my heartburn, uh, every night. And, uh, you know, I take, you know, this medicine, and that medicine for anxiety or this or that, you know, some of it is completely useless for us. It does. It has nothing to do with what we're dealing with, but, uh, we may not know that. Okay. We may not know that then. So it's important for us to get those medicines. Usually this is the point where I say, do you have those medicines with you? Or I ask the person, you know, a bystander, usually a family member, something like that. Hey, can you gather up those medicines and put them in a plastic bag for me or a paper bag? Uh, I'd sure appreciate it. Or do you have a list of them? You know, and the ones that have been in and out of the hospital a long time, especially the elderly folks, they usually have a list uh, and a whole bag of uh, 50 bottles of medicine. So uh, it's important to get those, kind of sort through them. And you only need to take one bottle of each just so we kind of have an idea what's going on with it. And, uh, and that way they can look at the hospital and see if they need to adjust anything, those types of things. So P stands for pertinent medical history, past medical history. Uh, so again, pertinent, right? What's important, you know, so has, have you ever have broken your leg before? Uh, have you ever had pain in your stomach like this before? Uh, you've ever had, you know, so you're having chest pain, you ever had any heart attacks, breathing problems, you know, sometimes you have to coax them through these things. Okay. Some people just don't understand what you're talking about. And so, well, I don't know. I mean, you know, I went to a doctor when I was a kid. No, no, sir. Have you ever had a surgery? Have you ever had, you know, a problem like this before? Uh, any major medical problems where you had to see the see the surgeon or or a specialist or anything like that? And oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I had my kidney taken out. Well, you know, that's good to know, right? So those things sometimes you have to pull it out of them, um, and it's not always the ones that are defiant that you have to pull it out of. Some sometimes people are just confused, especially if they're in pain or they're just you know they're out of it. You know, they've been up all night throwing up and they're just, you know, sleepy. They're very lethargic. And so you have to kind of kind of ease through things and, and dig it out of them. So last oral intake. So we just want to kind of have an idea of when they ate last. You know, depending on the, the medical condition or the issue that we're having, this can this can answer questions about dehydration, about uh, glucose levels, uh, you know, salt levels. You know, all these different types of things that we can that are affect the heart, uh, breathing, um, you know, any any number of, of issues that they may be having level of consciousness, um, you know, can answer can answer that. So, again, just by asking these questions, we can answer a lot of the questions that we might have about the problem that they're having. So, you know, when's the last time you had anything to eat or drink? You know, you can ask it like that. You know, when's the last time did you, you know, if depending on the time of day, if it's two in the afternoon, hey, would you, did you eat lunch a little while ago? No, I had to skip lunch, I'm stick to my stomach. I didn't feel like eating, you know. Yeah, well, what would you have for breakfast? Oh, well, I, I, I didn't have breakfast either, you know, but I, I, and I didn't take my medicine. Or I took my medicine, but I didn't eat, right? So depending on the type of patient we're dealing with, you know, that's a big deal. You have to eat with some of these medicines or you have to eat a meal and take the medicine for the whole thing to, to work out. So, <clears throat> so it's important to, to notate that. Then events leading up to, or events associated with, again, it kind of goes into our um, mechanisms of, mechanism of injury or nature of illness. So how did this come to be, right? This helps kind of put together those pieces of the puzzle. And we try to, you know, usually it's what were you doing when this happened? When were you? What were you doing when you felt like this? You know, and it may be, hey, I was asleep and it woke me up. And I started feeling this pain in my chest. I was just driving along and then all of a sudden I started feeling dizzy, right? Or it could be something that is contributing. I was, I was jogging and I just decided I was going to do some sprints. I never do sprints, but. I went ahead and did some sprints and see how it felt and, and, um, you know, my chest started to hurt. Okay. 
Well, there we go. You know, we got to have a stressor there that might help, you know, incite some type of issue with your heart. So again, these these things are important uh, to try to start digging down into the into a few of these things, and you're really going to help to answer some of the questions that you're going to have that you would have for the issue that you're that you're dealing with. Okay. Anybody have any questions on sample? Again, something that you can do, you can do it on your next call. For those of you who are in the fire service, law enforcement, things like that, take your piece of two-inch tape, keep a roll of that, take a little, take a little piece of it, tear it off, and put it on the thigh of your pants. Just, just, just tape it to your front of your pants. All right, it's not going to hurt anything. Take your pen out, and most pens will write on that, on that tape, that that silk tape or whatever, and just. Right on that S A M P L E, okay, and then and then you can start to just kind of, again, fill in those mnemonics: signs and symptoms, allergies, medications, past medical history, last oral intake, and events leading up to. And the more you do that, the more you refresh yourself, remind yourself, and even, and if you are the one that's that's do, already taken, uh, you know, patient history, you know, or as somebody else is doing it. Write those things down next to each one of those letters and go back and look at it and review it and go, okay, all right, I see what they were doing there, okay? And that's that's going to be one of those things that you just have to memorize. You have to use it, uh, and, and you'll after a while, you just you can't forget it. It'll, it'll be stuck in your head. So before we get into the secondary assessment, we're going to take about 10 minutes and uh, – let everybody get caught up. I guess my internet might be lagging tonight or something like that. So let it get caught up and uh, see what the issue is with that. But uh, so we'll come back in about 10 minutes. Hey, Justin, I can't hear you. We're taking a break.
All right, everybody. <clears throat> Going to get started back here uh, with secondary assessment. So, like I said, with with uh, primary assessment, we've we've uh, identified any major life threatening injuries, anything, any uh, life threatening uh, issues that might be going on with our patient, and we've we've assessed those. We maybe you know fixed those, and then we are uh, going into our history taking and making sure that we kind of have a general idea of what's what's happening here right we have a we have a, a, a chief complaint um we've gotten vital signs we've you know we're starting to kind of work our way uh work our way into our secondary assessment here <clears throat> so with the secondary assessment we're looking for a lot of majority of the non-life-threatening conditions and, and or we're going deeper into what was life-threatening. So if there was a life-threatening issue and we, we help fix it, then we are um, then we're going into our, our secondary assessment. Again, we're not going forward unless we um, unless we fix those life threats. OK, so. We don't uh, we don't move on to the secondary assessment until we until we get that those primary things taken care of. Okay. So essentially, we're gonna again do a more focused exam, a more um, detailed look at, at what the issue is um, or what the injuries are, uh, depending on what we're talking about, medical or trauma. And that physical exam helps to locate and begin initial management and signs and symptoms of the, of the illness or injury. Uh, a sign is something about the patient, like we talked about, that you know that uh, we can see or feel, and then the symptoms are the things that we can't see, and that usually that the patient will tell us about. Okay. <clears throat> so depending on what we're looking at here, this is this is some more things, uh, not so much on the dots on table 9.2, but 9.3 here, DCAP BTLS. This is one that you need to write down. You need to make sure that you remember this as we go forward, especially in trauma. Okay. DCAP BTLS will follow you throughout your EMS career in trauma. Um, so not to exclude dots, it's, it's just not something that's very popular. It's not something that's been around very long. Uh, and again, it's just this textbook uses it. Uh, but it really just kind of says the same thing. Uh, when it says signs of injury, you know, mainly it's just main, you know, large, um, easy to spot type thing. So deformities, open injuries, tenderness, and swelling. Um, so it, that kind of gives you a little bit of, uh, <coughs> excuse me, gives you a little bit of uh, stages there of, of signs of injury. But on the DCAP BTLS side, it this gives us an idea of if they said, oh well, you know, I have, or on the second on the secondary assessment side, whenever I'm looking through the body around the body uh, for these things, uh, this is what I'm looking for. Okay, deformities is something out of place, right? It could be anything. It could be the neck. It could be the head. It could be the, you know, the elbow. You know, uh, chest. You know, one side of the chest is caved in, you know, any number of things that could be deformed uh, could be, you know, the end of the pinky is turned to the right. <laughs> OK, so that's deformity. Uh, contusions or bruises, right? Black and blue, reddish, you know, anything like that. Um, you know, so we're looking for any, any type of contusions, uh, abrasions. So road rash, um, you know, anything like that that kind of just scraped the top of the skin. You know, we're looking we're looking for things of that nature, punctures or penetrations. So again, that could be anything from flying debris from a from a hurricane or tornado that punctured the skin, or gunshot wounds, stab wounds. You know, somebody. Uh, <clears throat> you know, somebody was. I mean, again, it, it, you can get crazy with all this different stuff people have ever been stabbed with. Um, but uh, you know, shotgun blast. So you have multiple pellet. You know, holes, little be small pellet holes all over the place. Um, you know, any number of things like that. We're looking for anything that may have punctured or penetrated the skin. Burns. So, again, it, it could be somebody that made the car rolled over on them and now they have the, the exhaust has burned them. 
So it could be on their back. You know, they may have injuries on the front and the back, and they have burns on the back and not on the front. Um, you know, it could be on their hands where they were trying to defensively hold hold something hot back. <clears throat> Excuse me. It could be inspiratory burn. I mean, uh, it should be burns around the mouth and nose that when they were in a house fire uh, or a car fire. Uh, tenderness uh, on letter T there. The tenderness would be as we're as we're going around and we're we're palpating, which means we're touching our patient. We're we're feeling the skin. We're, we're feeling the tissue, and it's um, it's tender, right? So it just oh man, that hurts. Ow. Okay. Uh, you get that response in that area. We want to notate that. Okay. Well, how bad is that hurt? Where where exactly does it hurt? You know. So we can start to each one of these. We can actually start to ask little bitty qualifying questions about each one and kind of get a better feel for. Uh, for each one and making sure that we we understand exactly where it's at, how it feels, that sort of thing. And then S is for swelling. So if we have swelling, uh, a lot of times it's usually a later stage, and, you know, maybe take a, take several minutes for that swelling to start and to build up to where we can actually tell. So that may tell us that hey, this thing is this thing's pretty serious. It's swelling up pretty fast. Okay. Uh, well, it's a very uh, it's a very um, you know, weak area, and so that area is more prone to swelling than others. <clears throat> but again, all these things help us to identify whether our patient is conscious or not. Okay, we can go down and look for all these different things. I don't need to have to. I don't have to ask them any questions. I mean, it's good, like I was telling you just just a moment ago, that we can kind of qualify some of these things. But if we can't, Again, we still can get a lot of good information uh, by looking for DCAT BTLS uh, in our trauma patients. So make sure you write that one down and memorize it. So secondary assessment of the entire body, uh, like I told you before, it needs to be a head to toe physical exam, uh, looking behind the ears, in the ears, underneath the neck, you know, in through the hair, uh, you know, any any all over the place from head to toe. Uh, so assume that all unconscious injured patients have spinal injuries. You know, again, on the trauma side, we try to uh, try to ensure that we are protecting their their uh, spine as, as best as possible until we can clarify otherwise. Uh, stabilize the head and spine and minimize, you know, movement. And then, excuse me, it says that skill drill 9-1 to one, nine to one is a form of full body assessment, and that we can get into that after a while. So examine a specific area of the body. Like I said, if they once you have that um, some of that information about you know where the injuries are, how they feel, that sort of thing, then we can actually start to do a, an actual physical exam. And and you know we're we're we want to see if there's any you know if it's a broken potentially tenderness around a let's say the the uh, <clears throat> ulna radius, right? So the the bones in our in our lower arm. If we're looking at the ulna radius and we, we start to feel around, and oh man, it hurts right there. Okay, all right. So we're feeling around, and we can start to feel something sharp, maybe under the skin, <clears throat> and we have some deformity there. You know, that's a, maybe a good indication that they potentially have a fracture, right? So little things like that, we want to we want to check. Uh, again, everybody's body style, body size is different. So when you have patients with a lot more uh, adipose uh, fat tissue and, and they're just bigger people, uh, it may, they, things may not just stand out right away. So you have to actually put your hands on there, feel through that, and, uh, and make sure that, that, uh, that there's something going on. So we try to, we try to look at the, the, the worst things first, right? So as we we went through our physical exam, we start to we start to see those issues that are popping up, and we kind of prioritize them um, as things that may hurt our patient. What, what's going to make our patient sicker, or give them more injury, or make what's going to make the injury worse faster, right? So we want to we want to address those as soon as possible. So assess some vital signs, like we said before. The uh, resting, resting adult uh, respiratory rate is 12 to 20 breaths per minute. Uh, again, we just count those those breaths for one minute. So as we're doing that, again, we've kind of we, our patient is is there um, 
it doesn't have any major medical major issues major major emergency things that we need to take care of and and so we can sit there and again once you once you get comfortable with it you can kind of be a little slick and and you can have a conversation with somebody and count the respirations right you can you can sit there and check their pulse while they while they tell you stuff you know so it, it, all these different things we can do uh at the same time but it's not a problem you know just let them know hey look i'm just going to you know check a few things here i'm going to put my hands on you you know hope my hands aren't too cold but i'm going to put my hands on you and uh and uh we're just going to you know check your breathing and check your pulse that sort of thing is that okay oh yeah no problem no problem you know and um and so we'll just do that we'll we'll kind of stand to the and kind of stand to the side and put your hand on their chest however you want to do it uh but we're really just looking for that chest rise and fall um you know we're looking for that 12 to 20 breaths per minute um, for over the course of about one minute uh check the breathing rate and quality you know is it is it hard for them to breathe when they take a big deep breath is it painful um you know is it is their breathing rate really fast and and thready so is it kind of just short short breaths <clears throat> you know so all these things that we we talked about in respiratory is uh or airway is important that we notate uh for um going forward and we can start to see you know is something is whatever their chief complaint is is that making their breathing worse is this what's causing that um you know is it pain so is there is it because are they having these is they breathing this way because they um they have broken ribs and so it's hard for them to breathe right so it may be a trauma issue so any number of different things that that can cause that but that's one of the things that we want to notate is their breathing rate and quality so their pulse like i said before we're going to you know initially we're going to check for that carotid pulse making sure they actually have a pulse at all and then when we start going into their radial pulse we're going to try to take their we try to take the actual we try to assess their pulse uh through the radial pulse so if they have a radial pulse we want to check that and try to get their their pulse rate so depending on your patient it's going to depend on what that might be um but we want to uh we want to ensure that it's within normal ranges <clears throat> so for the again we, we take it at the carotid pulse for the unconscious patient just to make sure that they're not you know uh that may just, like i said just to make sure that they actually have one um and when we talked about that the other day about the break in cpr with the infant we want to make sure that we check the pulse in an infant in the brachial artery right right there uh on top of the humerus bone and the upper arm Okay, so right there between the bicep and tricep, two fingers, that's all it takes. So it's a pressure real hard in, in a baby, and that's where we're going to check our pulse there. So again, between 60 and 100 beats per minute in your adults, a little bit higher, a good bit higher, 120 or so for children, I mean for infants. And uh, and that will give us our, our normal um, heart rate. And again, over the course of one minute. You know, we're going to sit there and put two fingers on that uh, that radial pulse and just look at your watch, get it to a minute and count those. You know, you can close your eyes, you can do whatever you got to do, but uh, don't look at, try not to look at your watch because you'll end up counting seconds and not beats. So just start the timer, look at it and go, okay, I'm starting and then count those beats and, and every so often glance over at the watch and see what the time is when it gets to one minute total up your beats and and that's your pulse okay mentioned capillary refill earlier this is another little uh, quick assessment tool uh just to help see how you know what their oxygenation is like and what their um distal perfusion okay so uh, see how see if the body is able to push blood down to the to the uh extremities down to the feet and toe i mean the fingers and toes and that lets us know that the pump is working decent okay we have, we have a we have a decent uh it's actually pump be able to pump enough blood out to those areas <clears throat> so we do that again usually just one of the main uh one of the you know two or three fingers of the of the hand you know right there at the nail bed we literally just take our thumb and forefinger put it on the top and bottom press down on the nail bed um not super hard doesn't take much if it's uh if it's pink pink to start with we press on it and it's white and it comes back to pink within just a couple seconds. I mean, we just went within one, within one second. 
you know, we're, we're doing pretty good. Uh, if you have a pretty, if you have a long lag time there, uh, before it turns back to pink, then we know we have our perfusion issue. So blood pressure, again, we get, we get into skills. We'll, we'll actually take blood pressures and all that sort of stuff. And, and, uh, and you guys will be sick of doing that, but <clears throat> it's, uh, it's, again, it's important to, it's important to get these things right. It's not always the easiest. Not everybody has good pressure to, to get one with. Sometimes they're really weak and, and hard to hear. Sometimes the environment that you're in makes it hard to hear. Uh, you know, there's extrication equipment cutting people out of cars or there's passing vehicles on the roadway. There's, you know, idling fire trucks and ambulances and police car sirens and, you know, all sorts of crazy stuff out there. So uh, that can cause us to have issues hearing these things. So it's in with the stethoscopes in your ears, it's you can kind of hear it, it makes obviously it makes hearing enhanced. So. Uh, you kind of have to have it in the right spot and make sure that you're you're right over that artery, and uh, and you can hear it really good. But uh, a systolic pressure is the force extended on the walls of the arteries as the heart contracts, and diastolic pressure is the arterial pressure during the relaxation phase of the heart. Okay, so uh, again, whenever one is contraction, one is relaxation uh, phase of the heart, and so the big one that we that we usually focus on is the systolic pressure, the top number. Okay, so the systolic is usually going to be on top, diastolic is going to be on the bottom. So if we say, you know, just like you see there, 140 over 90 um, is hypertension, right? Um, that means that our blood pressure is is high okay so we have a high blood pressure with hypertension hyper being high hypo being low right so um you know if we look at that and go oh 140 you know that's that's a hot the heart is contracting at a higher pressure than what it should okay so that again gives us a little bit of cause for concern there and we want to make sure that we don't we, we don't want it to get higher than that Mm -hmm. And we, we want to try to get it down. So check your blood pressure by palpation and, and, uh, and an auscultation. So auscultation is what we talked about with, you know, with putting your stethoscope in your ears and, and actually listening. Um, palpation, you can, if you have your blood pressure cuff, you can pump it up and then look at the gauge. And once you feel that pulse come back in the wrist, then at that point, when you when you feel that point, when you feel that happen and you look at see what that number is, when that happens on the gauge, that's your systolic pressure. OK, that's the return of systolic pressure. So that um, you may hear people say, oh, it's uh, their blood pressure is 140 palp. OK, that's what that means. That's how they did. They, that they just got the one part of the number. OK. So whenever we're taking this, whenever we're taking blood pressure, we want to make sure that we get both numbers. Okay, so that's why we have a sphygmomanometer, sphygmometer. All right, that's a huge, big word for that little gauge in the blood pressure cuff. Okay, it's called a sphygmomanometer, a sphygmometer. Um, and that's that. What that does is it helps to we can listen for two different bumps so first we uh we pump it up to around 200 or so and we or or until there is not a pulse and that's really the 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 scientific way to do it is to pump up the cuff until we don't feel a pulse in the wrist once we do that we will then uh place our stethoscope right over the usually around the what we refer to as the anti cubita fossa which is the crease of the elbow, okay? The interior crease of the elbow, and there's there's uh, vein, there's vessels and, I mean, uh, veins and arteries that run through there, and so we want to usually put it over just to the uh, to the medial side of the arm, okay? The interior interior side of the arm, 
and that usually will give you kind of a good uh, location so where that brachial artery is kind of running down a little bit more towards the the middle and so we want to uh, or I'm sorry the, the medial side of the arm and we want to you know put our stethoscope on there hold it down general pressure with one hand usually you take your thumb and kind of wrap your hand underneath the elbow lock that elbow out and then uh, put the stethoscope on there and then we'll pump like I said we've already pumped it up and then once we let off slowly slowly we let off of the the pressure relief device whatever it might be it might be a little wheel or it might be a little trigger and we let go of that air let that air off and as we do so the first the first little bump that we feel the first pulse that we hear in our um in our ears is going we need to look and see what that number is that's our top number okay now we start to again slowly lower that lower that pressure uh, lower the uh, the air off and then as we do that we're, we're it's going to get fainter and fainter and fainter and fainter the last the last thing that we hear the last little bump that we hear that's going to be our bottom number okay that's going to be our, our diastolic number okay so first bump is systolic last bump is diastolic okay not difficult just takes practice takes listening to it uh again like i said it's it's there's a lot of different versions of uh, what people hear, and there's a lot of different ways you can hear it. And so uh, it just takes doing it in a lot of different conditions and different types of stethoscopes and all that sort of stuff. So, <clears throat> so again, we talked about skin color and conditions earlier. Uh, the normal body temperature is 98.6. I'm pretty sure everybody here has had their temperature checked 8 million times in the last few months. So, um, you know, we're probably pretty familiar with that. But uh skin color and condition that's typically how you hear it described uh so we want to you know the color obviously depending on the on the rest uh, race or ethnicity of the patient uh you know whatever corresponding skin color or skin color should it should be that um the temperature obviously we feel the temperature uh and they're they're really warm really cold you know we want to notate that and then uh any type of moisture so is it you know, is it warm, pink, and dry, or is it, uh, you know, um, cold, ashy, and uh, diaphoretic or, or moist or something like that? You know, we want to know those. We want to know kind of in that order, you know, uh, how the skin uh, is faring. Pupil size and reactivity, again, another one, especially when we get into like opioids and all that sort of stuff, um, and even uh, head injuries, especially, uh, we look at pupil size and reactivity to tell us whether or not um, the brain is responding. And so we use that, um, we use the pupils and the eyes to help tell us a good bit about that. So we examine each eye to detect signs of head injury, stroke, or uh, drug overdose. So as you can see here, looking from um, left to right, you have kind of normal pupils. Going to the right, we have like big saucer plates or, you know, silver dollar type size, you know, uh, pupils are just really big. The, the uh, pupil takes up almost the entire part of the eye. You can barely tell what color the eye is. Um, so those are called dilated pupils. And then uh, as we go over, we see what we call what we refer to as pinpoint pupils. Now we have several different sizes. We have a lot of different sizes in between there. Uh, depends on the light. So if you're in a bright condition and they have kind of you know really narrow um, uh, pupils, chances are that they're they may be bl a little blinded by the sun or the light or whatever so we try to do these things kind of in a in a look at uh, assess these uh usually like with a hand over the eyes or something like that or you know uh, some under some type of uh cover or something that way we can really assess it like with a flashlight we can take the flashlight put it into the eye and and see if it reacts to that light and we if it if it does that's great uh so it gets it's um you know it's kind of normal and then we put it into put the light in there and it starts to contract and then we take the light away and it expands okay we have a good reactive we have both pupils that are reacting equally um 
we refer to this as perla. The pupils are equal and reactive to light. Okay, um, so it, when we do that, a lot of times it may be if it's just kind of a you, you walk into somebody's house and it's just normal general lighting. There's no real, not a lot of sunlight. There's not a lot of bright light, and they're they're um, you know they're uh, their people. Excuse me, their pupils are pinpoint. Maybe having something going on there, right? But potentially going to be an opioid issue, some type of drug use issue. <clears throat> um, on the on the the um, dilated pupil side, uh, like I said, you may have some that have um, have a head injury. You know, could have that. Uh, sometimes they're just uh, they have a brain injury that has and that doesn't allow them to uh, regulate their pupil size, and then. Other times you'll see them where they're offset pupils, so they're unequal. So you have a kind of maybe like a regular pupil on one side and a blown, we call it a blown pupil on the other side. Um, this is usually indicative of like a stroke. So one hemisphere or one side of the brain uh, may be uh, affected, and that's affecting that pupil. I'm sorry, the opposite pupil. So if you don't know that, the... Um, Left hemisphere of the brain, the left side of the brain controls the right side of the body, and the right side of the body controls the left. Uh, the obviously the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body. So it's um, so that's kind of how we look at that. So if we have a blown pupil on the left, patient's left, then typically it's going to be some issue with the right side of the brain. So we talked about the APU scale earlier, and again, that's just one of those things where, as we're going through vital signs, we want to, you know, usually do that APU kind of just as our general walk up. Hey, how you doing? What's going on? Hey, man, can you hear me? Hey, you know, I know you just got thrown from that car, but hey, can you hear me? Can you hear me? And and that you know, again, we'll kind of work down that APU scale and see where we see where we sit, and then we'll go through obviously our vital signs a little bit after that. So reassessment, uh, we, you know, like I said before, and this is one of the things that I harp on, you know, with EMT students and first responder students is um, you need to be at a, I feel, I personally feel like, and professionally feel like you need to be at a level, uh, regardless of what your certification level is, I think you need to be at a level of comfortability with this stuff if you're going to do it for real. Um, you need to be a level of comfortability where you can feel comfortable being with that patient for half an hour. Okay. Um, you know, and, and depending on, on what your skill level is and things like that, um, your certification level, you know, obviously longer than that, but, but for first responder, you know, if you can be with that patient for 30 minutes by yourself, you're going to find that you're going to answer a lot of these questions and you're going to do all this stuff within um, within just a few minutes. OK, um, it, uh, you know, 10, 15 minutes is not unreasonable at all uh, to be to be doing this, to have a lot of this stuff uh, figured out. And so uh, but 30 minutes, the ambulance doesn't arrive They're not They're not going to arrive anytime soon. You know, they. Um, they just for for whatever reason they may be, um, you know, on, on other calls they are, uh, you know, they just have they have a bad wreck somewhere and it's taking multiple ambulances, you know, anything like that, you know, bad cardiac arrest, you know, or something of that nature. You can conceivably and depend, like I said, depending on where your location is, you you may be with that patient for a long time. So, it's important that you have something to do after that first 10 minutes after the primary and secondary assessment you need to have you need to be able to be comfortable with um with this reassessment process right so <clears throat> if our patient is really bad off you know and they keep declining you know they're at this level is not a ton of stuff that we can do um but Nonetheless, we can st still keep that trend assessment, uh, that trend of assessments. Like we started talking about trending of vital signs, we can trend our uh, our treatment. 
and make sure that what we are doing is for one, it's the right thing. Uh, we're not missing something that we could be doing. We can uh, reassess the things that we've already done and make sure that they are still good. Uh, they're, they're still working. You know, there's there's some outcome there, and uh, and uh, so all those things are super important after that that initial assessment. So biggest thing there, recheck recheck the patient's level of responsiveness and ABCs. So you know, if somebody's you know kind of lethargic and they're out of it, and and we we assess that they have some you know, have a breathing problem maybe, and we give them some oxygen, right? And maybe their level of responsiveness comes up. They start to kind of perk up. They get a little more oxygen in their system. Their brain clears up, and they start to come around, open their eyes, look at you, talk to you, that sort of thing. Okay, um, you know the blood pressure is a little bit better. The heart rate's a little bit better. You know. And so you can start to see an improvement in the patient. Well, that's great, right? So um, seeing that trend upward is great. It, it is a good thing, and we want to notate that. But we also want to use that as a as a baseline to see if they change, right? So if they change from that, um, you know, we know that we may have some other issue going on there. So continue to maintain open airway, monitor their breathing. You know, so for unconscious patients, especially, really want to look at them carefully and make sure that, you know, they may not may not be, you know, uh, crashing at the moment. Uh, but we were with this patient for the next 15, 20, 30 minutes. We need to make sure that everything is still staying as we as we put it. So. Reassess some vital signs so that blood pressure, pulse, uh, heart rate, skin color and condition. All those things we can go back through, check them again. Uh, you know, don't shortchange them. Don't shortchange yourself. Go back through each one of those. Do each one again every five minutes or so, and make sure that every that everything is the same. Again, we're trending our vitals, and um, and and writing those things down in order so we can time the time that we took those vitals, and that way we can uh, we have a good uh, picture forming of what's going on with our patient. OK, so especially if we do have a bad patient, we really don't want it, especially if it is a long time with our with that patient. We don't want when the ambulance does get there or the helicopter gets there. We don't want to waste a lot of time. We want to be able to give them a good, concise um, report and let them know that this is what we've done. This is what the patient's been doing. And I can show you this on paper. This is what the patient has been doing. And, you know, they're ready to go. They're packaged and they're ready to go. Right. <clears throat> so they should really realistically, they should be able to do a few things, talk to them for a second or, or check vital, check their take, let them take another quick look at their vitals and, and um, signs and symptoms and then check out, you know. So if you can do that, that's part of that golden hour. That's part of what makes a first responder invaluable is that or makes, yeah, makes them so invaluable is that they can. Um, they can cut down the time needed on scene, right? So if you're doing a good job there, there's no reason why they need to sit there and redo everything you just did. Okay. They need to take that patient and get gone and, and, and bring them to a higher level of care. So, you know, if, especially if we can talk to them, we we'll, we can reassess that chief complaint. Hey, you know, I know you said your, your, your uh, chest was hurting. You know, it was on a, was on a scale of one to 10, 10 being the worst pain you've ever had in your life. And you said it was an eight when I first got to you. What, what do you think it is now? Oh, it's, uh, it seems to be about a six an hour. Oh, man, it's a 10. Oh, man, it's hurting worse, right? So we can, again, start that trending on the pain scale. We can, you know, assess those numbers, see if they come up or down uh, on the chief complaint side and uh, and see if anything has changed with that. Well, my, you know, my, my chest doesn't hurt as much, but I'm just having difficulty breathing, all right? So we can start to kind of, factor in those those different those differences in what's actually going on so the effectiveness of treatment so as we uh do things for the patient whether it's a uh, again whether it's oxygen or we're assisting them with some type of medicine or you know uh, any number of things that we might do for them um you know did it work did it help did it improve the patient's condition So if we do have changes for the worse, we want to reassess. We want to we want to assess those, identify what those are, attempt to attempt to treat them. 
if we can't treat them, then we need to at least, you know, try to figure out as much as we can about it and uh, and let's notate it. That way we can start pushing that up the chain and let them know, hey, we have a change in patient status. They went they went downhill real fast. Now, you know, they're barely breathing and you're know, having to breathe for them or whatever. Right. <clears throat> So stable patients every 15 minutes, you know, so, you know, if patients just kind of like, oh, you know, I'm just, uh, they're, they're really not that bad off after their initial and secondary assessment. It's not too big of a deal. We're just waiting on the ambulance and the ambulance is taking forever. Then we'll reassess them every 15 minutes or so with, with all of our things, rounds of vitals, all that sort of stuff. And um, the our unstable patients every five minutes, right? So when when uh whenever we're having to do stuff for them they've been in, had significant mechanisms of injury that sort of stuff we want to make sure that we're checking them every five minutes and uh keep really keeping our eye on them so part of that like i told you before is that handoff report uh again if you especially if you're with the patient for a little while even so if, you, if you're jotting things down a certain way uh you know it kind of in that sample order um you know with a little bit of that kind of general patient information, name, date of birth, um, you know, sex and age of the patient, those types of things, you can you can kind of work your way down uh, as you're writing it, so that it basically becomes your report. Okay, so whenever the paramedic shows up or EMT or somebody shows up and says, "Hey, you know, what, what you got here? What's going on?" Okay. Hey, this is Mr. Smith. He's twenty, uh, you know, thirty-six year old male. He was complaining of chest pain. Um, you know, looks like looks to be like he fell off his motorcycle and uh, rolled down this hill. You know, he has a uh, complaint of uh, uh, difficulty breathing during inspiration. You know, so when he breathes in, he has some pain in his chest. Um, he's alert and oriented uh, to. Uh, he's alert, he's alert and oriented. And um, he was he was uh, lying face down in the in the ditch down there, and we we got him up, rolled him over, rolled him over, got him up, and uh, had him sit up. And he's uh, again complaining of that that difficulty breathing. We got a round of vitals on him. His blood pressure is this, heart rate's that, respiration is this, and um, and then no other. And we can tell him, hey, look, there's no other. Um, uh, no other issues that we found there's you know or you know if we did a secondary assessment we found that we had some crepitus or or bones rubbing together crunchiness you know to the rib to a rib we we did a palpation of his rib we felt his rib and uh we felt uh, what appears to be a, a fractured rib on the left side about five down and um you know that would be maybe something that we could say about our secondary assessment right so that that right there was kind of a, an overview of the patient and then we can also roll into our sample information um they're allergic to penicillin um you know doesn't take any medicine on a regular basis uh has never had any other med major medical problems before uh he ate he ate breakfast this morning with no issues and he was again riding his motorcycle down the road ran into a little wet patch and that's what happened uh why he ran off the road okay and then again, if we like I said before, if we did any interventions for him, gave him some oxygen or whatever, it might be something like we gave him, uh, we gave him you know, 15 liters of non by non rebreather mask, and um, and he seems to be uh, seems to be helping uh, his breathing a little bit, right? So, <clears throat> so all that I mean, you know that that fast, that easy, just kind of going down those little things that you've already gotten, you've already gotten all the information. You just want to put it into a, a manageable format that you can, that you can speak to the, to the, to that next uh, provider and let them know kind of a, a, a clear, concise uh, picture of what's going on with the patient up till now. Okay. Again, don't be offended, especially, you know, when you have higher level care pr providers, they're going to, they may start to, um, dig at dig deeper okay they just they, they have more training they have you know different experiences uh and so they may be asking them the same question you ask them but maybe in a different way uh to try to get a little bit more detail uh, about something so not all of them are going to just completely step on your uh on your assessment and go i don't care what you have to say 
Uh, but there are people that will do that. Uh, so again, don't take it personally. Just know that, you know, you did a good job and that, that uh, you did everything that you could for the patient and it's going to be up to them now to, to take them to a higher level of care. So, like I said, we have, uh, you know, we kind of have it broken up in a, in a trauma and medical uh, patient assessment. And again, that's like I told you before, we can have uh, a trauma patient who has a medical, has medical issues and vice versa. Somebody had a heart attack, right, as they were driving and then they hit a tree and now they have a head injury. OK, so that's that's an issue. <laughs> Right. That, that, that's happened. So those, these types of things do happen. And, uh, and so you have to be prepared to kind of look at the worst thing, the, the thing that's going to kill them first and start going with that. Right. So we're going to go down. If you look in, if you look at your skill sheets, um, it's kind of right about the middle there. Once you get through that primary survey, primary assessment, uh, and history taken, then we start to break off. Right. We break off into those, uh, issues, um, of more importance or th I'm sorry, things that we are looking at more in depth. So whether it's a medical patient, we want to look more deeper into their cardiac history and how many heart attacks they've had and how much their chest pain is and all this other stuff. Um, on the trauma side, we're looking more about, um, you know, is there, are they bleeding from somewhere? You know, do they have some type of broken bones, uh, anything that's going to affect their airway, uh, you know, any of these types of things. And we're, we're really kind of focusing on those cervical spine issues, brain injury issues, uh, you know, uh, fractures to the skull, you know, all these different types of, of major issues. We want to make sure that we are really touching on them specifically uh, and, and getting down to how bad this might be. So all the things that we just looked at with DCAP BTLS, you know, pupillary reactions, you know, all these different types of things that we're looking at on both the trauma and medical side um, are important as we go down this list and in the secondary assessment. And we're really starting to dig a little bit deeper into each one. And as we go into each one, we'll touch back on these uh, so that you kind of see how the assessment plays into the actual medical or trauma problem that is actually presented. So when examining medical patients, follow the basic assessment sequence. And like, and like I said, that's really important that you do that so that you can you, – all your information is in an orderly fashion, and it's going to make it easier for you to be able to pick one of those lanes. All right, I told you I was going to say that multiple times. You're going to hear it again later on too is that we have to work down the, one of those lanes to help figure out what's going on. Okay. <clears throat> So don't jump to conclusions. Don't try to. And the other thing, too, at this level, especially when we tell us the EMTs, we're not diagnosing patients. OK, we do not diagnose patients. Doctors diagnose patients. So but at some point. Our biggest thing is that we're really going to focus on that chief complaint. Um, if it's an unconscious trauma patient, then we're then we're going to try to figure out their chief complaint you know, uh, essentially the thing that's going to kill them the fastest, right? So that's what we're really what we're focused on. Medical patients, unconscious medical patients, same thing. We're looking at, we're really working uh, on utilizing the patient's body and the, uh, our vital signs to give us where the problem lies. Okay. So that's where we're trying to, that's really part of the, the big part of the puzzle with uh, unconscious patients is, uh, trying to search out and find what the actual problem is. So a lot of stuff here. This is not all inclusive. I'll uh, I'll I'll tell you that there is definitely a lot of different um, a lot of different things out there that we may you can run into. The um, hang on just one second. So there's a lot of different things out there that you'll that you'll run into the 
give me one second, guys. All right. So again, a lot of things you can run into, um, you know, with, with patient assessments and sometimes stuff is just coming at you so fast that it's really hard for you to tell, uh, the difference and trying to get all this information and realistically, you know, especially trauma scenes and, or crazy medical scenes with a lot of family and friends and, you know, or maybe in a crowded area and a movie theater, I mean, whatever it might be, you know, you really have to, you really have to cut through all the stuff and work your way uh, work your way down. So again, like I said, if you look, uh, if you look at the screen here, and you, or if you're following along uh, on your uh, on your sheets that you have, uh, like I said, you need to just work through these and and essentially memorize them. Uh, there's no other better way for me to tell you that. Um, I know it's a lot to try to memorize trauma and medical, but um, but once you start talking your way through it, you start applying the things that you're going to learn, uh, you will get, you, you know, it will get easier for you. As you, if you look all the way down at the bottom, it has several uh, critical criteria factors here that tells you, um, you know, kind of tells you some of the things that if you do any one of these, you fail. Okay, you fail the assessment. So it's important for you to look at these and make sure that, that you're doing those things. Uh, a lot of them are very simple things. And so, you know, again, if you go back to, you know, BSI is a scene safe and am, am I, am I taking care of any airway breathing and circulation problems right off the bat? you're usually going to be pretty good as long as you kind of follow along those things. And that's what a lot of those things have to deal with. So this is the medical uh, patient assessment. So if you're, if you're going down the, if you're going down the line here, uh, determines the scene or situation is safe, right? So at the top is, is like I said, BSI or PPE uh, and is the scene safe? So those two right off the bat, we're asking that question of our examiner. Hey, you know, I have my PPE on and my scene is, is my scene safe? Yes, the scene is safe. What is my nature? What is my nature of illness or mecha mechanism of injury? Right. So what happened? Going down, you know, do I need additional EMS assistance? Is that it, it, do I have multiple more than one patient? You're right. So any of those types of things, uh, any of those types of factors, you know, could result in you need more help. Um, request additional EMS, like I said, considers uh, stabilization of the spine. Okay, so that's another one of those uh, that you need to always be concerned about, whether it's medical or trauma. Again, this is the medical version, uh, but we still are, are considering that potential stabilization of the spine. So going into our primary survey or resuscitation there, uh, we just talked about APU, right? So determine level of consciousness. Quick shake and shout, hey, hey, are you okay? And see what their consciousness level is. Do I need to yell at them some more? Do I need to rub them? Do I need to apply a little bit of pain? You know, what's what uh, what level are they at, right? We want to know that. So, again, determine chief complaint or parent life threats. <clears throat> Again, if we can't get them to tell us, or we, if, if they're unconscious or just so out of it that we can't get this information out of them, then we're kind of going into a, well, okay, well, if I can't, if I can't get any information out of them, I need to make sure that they're not going to die in the next few minutes, right? So let's make sure that they're breathing, that they have a pulse, that you know, all those different types of things, right? So we're making sure that they are, um, that that everything is okay as far as any major life threats. So we do that again, airway, breathing, circulation, right? So we, we're going down those next two next two points there. Uh, assessment, so we're look, listen, and feel, assures adequate ventilation. So if they need ventilation, we're, we're, giving those, we're giving those ventilations adequately and initiates appropriate oxygen therapy. So if they, if they need oxygen therapy, we're going to make sure that we're given the right uh, amount through the right mask or the right, the, uh, the right um, adjunct. So whether it's a... Um, you know, a nasal cannula, a bag valve mask, or a 
non-rebreather mask, you know, we're going to make sure that we're doing that appropriately. Making sure we're not giving those breaths too much and all that other stuff. That goes, goes into adequate ventilation. Same thing, all the stuff we talked about in CPR, right? Assess circulation. Again, same thing. Look for any major bleeding. Check for pulse, skin color, and condition. So all the things we've been talking about, you know, this, this evening, you know, it starts working its way into this assessment tool. Okay. So uh, as we go down, identifies patient priority and makes a treatment or transport decision. So based off the chief complaint um, or your uh, primary survey, your primary assessment, we can kind of get an idea of, hey, you know what, this patient's, you know, not breathing well. It's, you know, he's not circulating blood well, um, you know, something like that. It's, it's, or has some kind of a major life threat uh, that we, we, we got uh, controlled, but it's still pretty serious and we got to go. Uh, so uh, we just need to know if we can either what we call load and go or stay and play. So can we stay and, and continue on to get some history and, do a secondary assessment, that sort of thing, or do we need to take this in the back of the ambulance and get moving and do that sort of thing in the back of the ambulance, right? So uh, the other big the other big part of that is if we can't fix the, anything in the primary survey, we need to go. Okay, that's the biggest one. So moving on to history taken, what we just kind of came off of there, um, as you can see, history of the present illness, depending on the Depending on, you know, usually the it's going to be like a pain level. So a lot of times you're, you're going to get some type of discomfort or pain level. And um, generally with that, we give it some type of description. Okay. So when we're describing pain or we're getting a description of pain, uh, we use OPQRST. This is another one that you need to make sure you highlight and write down. And uh, this is how when we ask somebody, hey, uh, are you in pain? You hurting anywhere? And they go, oh yeah, man. Oh, oh, my chest is hurting. Okay. Well, that's pretty general statement, right? We need to dig deeper. We need to know more about that pain. Um, so onset, when did this, when did this start? When, when did this, uh, you know, how long has this been going on? Right. Or I'm sorry. Yeah. What, what, what brought this on? When did it, when did it start? Well, I mean, you know, it, uh, they started like two hours ago and, um, you know, it, it was, it just kind of came on all of a sudden. Okay. All right. Good deal. So, uh, is there anything that makes it worse? Is there anything that provokes it, that provocation? Is there anything that whenever you sit a certain way or you move or anything, does it make it worse? Yeah. Well, you know, when I, when I sit up or whatever, I feel nauseous and, and it kind of makes my pain worse or whatever. Okay. So quality say, um, you know, is it, is it like a stabbing pain, a pressure, like somebody sitting on your chest? Like what kind of pain is it? Right. So we can kind of start getting a little more descriptive in the quality. Radiation just means does it go from a location, a prime location out or around to other locations? So, uh, you know, a typical one would be radiating chest pain uh, that goes out uh, up into the jaw, uh, side of the neck, and then down into the shoulder and the arm. Right. So that's a that's usually it's that's one where radiation kind of comes into play a lot of times. Other times may be uh, rebound tenderness of like um, if you have, <clears throat> excuse me, like an appendix rupture or something of that nature. Uh, usually when you press on on there, you'll have some radiating pain through the back kidneys, kidney issues, things like that, too. will have radiating pain to the front. OK. Severity. We've already talked about this. Uh, the best way to do it is, hey, uh, and, you know, you're hurting, right? You said you're hurting your chest. On a scale from 1 to 10, 10 being the worst pain you've ever felt in your entire life, what would you say your pain is right now? Oh, man, it's a it's an 8. Okay, it's an 8. Now, there's other pain skills out there um, that use the facial expressions of people, and that's one that the hospital uses a good bit. Uh, if you ever sat in a hospital room, especially like Forest General, they'll have these little um, grimacing faces, uh, in a row and you, you basically tell them, you know, I feel like that one, you know, and that kind of gives them same thing. We just add a, we just put a point scale to it. I mean, we put a, uh, um, a low, a number to it. 
so then the time essentially is how long how long has it has it uh, has it been going on so again opqrst helps to define pain okay so again write that one down highlight it remember that one so going on down again our pace our past medical history we just talked about that right our, our sample history signs and symptoms allergies medications past medical history last role intake and events leading up to the present uh, problem so uh, again all the stuff we've just been talking about and then of course like I said we, we, we just what we just left we're talking about secondary assessment and this where this is where I said you know if we're gonna if we're gonna start to basically take our chief complaint and work down a path, right? Is it going to be cardiovascular? So in this case, we have chest pain. Um, you know, it's cool, clammy, and 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 moist to the touch, right? Things like that. We can maybe, you know, we can probably start saying, all right, their chief complaints, chest pain, yeah, and he takes a big deep breath, and he's not really having any trouble breathing per se. It's kind of a shorter shorter breath, but it's not painful. Uh, it's not difficult to breathe. Um, you know, maybe it's not a respiratory issue. It's, it's you know, as far as his chest goes, it sounds like it may be a cardiac issue. So we can start to kind of go down the cardiovascular route. Um, so once we get vital signs, so now we have a kind of an idea, a hunch to start working on, right? And then we can go into our vital signs, get our vital signs, our blood pressure, pulse, respiratory rate, skin, skin color and condition. And we can start to assess whether or not uh, you know, the, the, our hunch is, is real. Okay. We can start to see, okay, well maybe, you know, it uh, looks like your, your pulse is, is really high. Um, you know, your blood pressure's, you know, kind of low, uh, your respiratory rate is, is kind of, kind of fast. Um, you know, these are, these are, these are signs and symptoms, or, or I mean, these are symptoms of, you know, uh, something going on with your heart. You know, so we can again, and that's that's literally where that's literally where we stop at. Yeah, at this level, that's kind of we can we can basically kind of get a, a ballpark and go, hey, the things that we've done kind of point us in this direction. Okay, and, and that's that's kind of it for us. Uh, we kind of start working our way towards, um, you know, again digging a little bit deeper, just as far as the information goes. But as, as far as us being able to do a whole lot about it, uh, there's not a whole lot. Uh, again, with that type of patient, we would, uh, you know, with shortness of breath, things like that, we would give them oxygen. Obviously, that was kind of a little bit more out there towards the top. We would find that out a little bit earlier. But um, those are, you know, that's probably one of our biggest things for something like that would be would be oxygen administration. Try to try to oxygenate the blood as best we can so that the blood that they are getting is going to be well oxygenated and um and carry that oxygen to the brain and all that sort of stuff and to the, 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 the heart muscle. Uh, so again, that would be, that would fall under interventions, right? Uh, so it says their state's field impression of the patient. And again, once so kind of like your, Hey, you had a general impression, right? Your general impression of the patient, your, your chief complaint that kind of gave us a little bit of a, Hey, when I, when I first started talking to this patient, Kind of got a general idea of what's going on, you know. This is this was what I I feel like is is happening, and now that I've gotten all this information, I've done all these things. What is my field impression now that I've given a little bit of time and effort? You know, now what do I feel like is happening here? And that's essentially part of those one of those paths. What path did you go down, um, and and how do you feel um, this patient needs to, you know, what what actions do we need to take for the patient? So reassessment, again, like we said just a few minutes ago, we're going to take all that information and we're going to redo it, you know, okay? Uh, and like I said, a lot, of this a lot of the stuff you can get by talking or looking at your patient, you can answer a lot of those questions. So you don't necessarily have to physically do that all the time. Uh, but things like your vital signs, <clears throat> uh, again, digging deeper into your, your OPQST, your OPQRST, getting those numbers again, and seeing if that pain scale has changed, uh, if their uh, AVPU level has changed, you know, so all those things we're, we're starting to re-add those up and see, again, add that to the trend, put that down in the next block, right? And so we have block one, block two, block three as, as we reassess, making sure that, you know, we can look and say, hey, this patient improved, this patient improved for, you know, 10 minutes. And then here in minute, you know, 15, they're starting to decline 
Okay, and we can uh, we can show that decline. So that's the uh, that is the uh, medical patient assessment. Look at trauma real quick. <coughs> uh oh, that's a bad gateway. There we go. All right. So trauma patient assessment. Again, as you can see, essentially the same stuff from the, at the top. Nothing, you know, you, as long when you have that top done, you, you pretty much uh, just re, re, repeating it. Uh, as we get down to the primary survey, similar things. We're worried about life threats. So determine responsiveness, AVPU, uh, determine chief complaint any of your life threats, and then we're going through ABCs, there we're breathing circulation, anything that we need to do for them, if we are doing something for them, then we're giving the appropriate oxygen therapy, the appropriate adequate ventilation, um, you know, managing any injury. So one of those things where we find it and fix it. So as we're going through airway, breathing, circulation in our trauma patients, and we're looking for all that DCAT BTLS at the same time, we are also, um, uh, fixing things. So we're fixing any major life threats, so we, any major bleeding, again, any airway issues, uh, anything that, that needs to be controlled right now so the patient doesn't die with, on us in the next several minutes. So assessing all these things in, air, in our airway, breathing, circulation, as we would before. And then going down, it says identify patient priority and makes treatment transport decision. Same thing like we said before, you know, is this patient bad bad enough to where uh, they need to go right now? Or, you know, do they have a, a fractured wrist and everything else is pretty much okay? Their, their, you know, their mental status is good, you know, things of that nature. You know, we can kind of hang out here for a minute, get a few, get some more details worked out, and then we'll get them, you know, splinter, splinter wrist and get them on up to the hospital, you know, in, in a timely manner. But we don't have to just tear out of here, right? So, again, load and go or stay in play. So history taken, same way. We're going to obtain those baseline vital signs, get a sample history. Um, and so we get, try to get a little bit more information about our patient, make sure we don't have any underlying issues that might make their trauma problems worse. Okay. So if they have medical problems that they've been having or have had before, could potentially make our trauma problems worse. Right. It makes sense. So those are things that we have to um, try to consider as well. All right. We're considering the whole patient. We're not just looking at the at the at the bleeding from the arm or, you know, the the open fracture, you know, sticking out of the arm or whatever. Right. Or dislocated knee and all this other stuff. OK. Um, you know, an, an eye popping out is not necessarily going to kill them. OK. Uh, so these are things that you know, we have to try to overlook and make sure we focus on the things that are going to kill them quickly. Um, and then again, same thing. We also want to get a, an understanding of, you know, what may make it worse for them. So we obtain that sample history and we go on into that secondary assessment. Just like we were talking about a little while ago, head to toe. And we're, we're doing that DCAT BTLS for everything. DCAT BTLS for the head and face, ears, you know, all the way over the front of the body, all the way from head to toe, right? We're checking for the clavicles, making sure they're good, ribs, sternum. We're pressing on the stomach, making sure we don't have any rigid uh, parts of the stomach. Um, you know, <clears throat> again, feeling our way down. Uh, this is one that we really have to put our hands on our patient and start to feel around, even the ones that are conscious. Hey, you know, maybe standing up talking to you. Hey, hey, man, just be be still for me for a second. I'm going to touch on you a little bit. Tell me if it hurts anywhere, okay? And we're pressing and feeling and all that sort of stuff, pressing on the stomach, you know, uh, you know, hips, all that sort of thing. We're rocking hips back and forth, making sure they're stable. Uh, we're feeling down the legs, and uh, we're looking for holes in the in the clothing. You know, we're looking for any type of entry wounds, uh, exit wounds, anything like that as we as we feel around and uh, and trying to get a good idea of what's going on uh, with the whole body. OK. So as you can see there, we're going from head to toe all the way down each extremity, 
uh, individually front and back. And again, like I said, conscious or unconscious, it doesn't really matter. But they're, if they're laying down, especially, we're going to roll them over, check the back, make sure that they uh, don't have any uh, issues uh, with their back, or back of their neck, back of their head, um, their their buttocks, you know, you know, any bleeding or any anything coming out of the anus, uh, you know, anything like that, you know, as gross as it may sound, uh, we, you know, we need to look at for, for things like that. Uh, we just, you never can tell what those, the, those events leading up to, okay, uh, the E in sample uh, can be as wild and as crazy as your imagination can take it, okay, so just be, um, just be cautious of all those different types of things. Again, this could be a tree trimmer. As I, I've seen this case before in like South Florida, tree trimmer up cutting trees like palm trees. And he's got several pieces of palm tree already cut at different lengths. And he fell and the chainsaw like cut his leg and um, it like slipped, cut his leg. And he threw the chainsaw and he fell down onto one of the, part of the stumps that were sticking up and it actually like went uh in the anus out the out the buttock you know so it, you know, i mean it, it was literally he was like impaled with that you know so i mean as far as trauma goes the sky's the limit okay uh you really have to you really have to be ready for anything and so that's why we look at everything check everything like i told you before with entry wounds uh, puncture wounds things like that um you know again somebody trying to walk from the shed to the house during a tornado or hurricane. Um, it doesn't take much. You could take a, a twig and that twig might be going 80 miles an hour and stick in somebody. So you have a small puncture wound. Same thing with gunshot wounds, stab wounds. They don't all have to be big, gnarly, uh, wounds. A lot of, a lot of gunshot wounds, especially are very small. So it may not bleed. So again, be looking for all those different types of things. So again, any things that you find during that secondary assessment, we want to make sure that we treat those as well. So this is the time where we start to kind of wrap things up, kind of make things look nice, clean stuff up, wipe the blood off of stuff so we can kind of see, you know, so that secondary assessment is where we kind of really start focusing on, on those, those smaller things. <clears throat> and then uh, reassessment, okay? Uh, like I said, reassessing, you know, every uh, five minutes for our critical patients and 15 minutes for patients that aren't. Aren't, aren't too bad. Uh, again, it's important that we do that and we, we get good at, at doing that reassessment and uh, and digging a little bit deeper, especially if we have patients that we can talk to uh, really or, or bystanders that have, are very knowledgeable about the patient. Uh, you know, let's start digging into that history, start digging into the depth of what happened, mechanism of injury depth and see what, uh, you know, how they actually impacted, what they actually impacted, what they, you know, what hit them where and also the sort of stuff. We can start to, you know, really get a good um, wound pattern so we can see, hey, well, they hit their head first and they hit their back and then they hit their chest. And, you know, we can kind of start putting things in order. If we have time to do that, great. If we don't, we're on the road, we're in the back of the truck and we're gone. All right. And we'll figure it out later. Any questions on any of this stuff so far? None. Zero. Okay. All right. So, uh, again, same thing as uh, like I told you guys last time, uh, still several of you that are, that haven't taken several of your quizzes. Okay. You need to get in there and try to get caught up. All right. Uh, I know some of you, are, you know, switching shifts last week or so and, and, uh, moving around and things like that, but please try to make time and knock out those quizzes, uh, read your chapters. Okay. Before you do that, and uh, and make sure that you you have a good understanding. If you don't have a good understanding, I'm gonna tell you this every class, you need to reach out. Okay, you've got to reach out to me uh, or Rob and and let us know that you're having an issue so that we can help you along. Scores are looking pretty good. I know you have a couple hiccups here and there. Again, if you have questions about things, you know, go back and look them up. Uh, take those take those answers that you missed. Go back and research them. That's probably the best way to kind of. Um, reinforce what you missed and um and if not if it's still not making sense by all means please call me and i'll be happy to walk you through it okay um so again last alibi anybody have any questions or anything that we covered tonight
All right, good deal. Like I said, you know, the whole time we're doing this, you guys have got to, um, you got to memorize these two sheets. You got to, uh, you know, try to try to get good at that bedside manner, speaking to people, uh, going through your sample, AVPU, DCAT, BTLS, and all those different uh, acronyms. And we'll have more acronyms later, but, um, you know, try to remember those, write those down. If you're, if you're, you know, doing this for, for real already, you know, start using those things in, in your assessments and make sure that, uh, you know, that you're, that you're, you know, right, writing that stuff down and getting good at it. Okay. All right. So tonight's class code is going to be, R zero 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 six, R zero 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 six. If you haven't already, like I said, you're uh, on Canvas. Your um, as you can see here, EMR R920 files, okay, on uh, the files tab here in the canvas. If you go down, you'll see class schedule R920, and that is, that is your uh, course syllabus, and you can see each class, and the dates may not match up now because we had to skip one, but, um, but you'll see what's coming up next. So next week, or I'm sorry, Thursday, we'll have, uh, we'll start talking about medical emergencies. OK, so those medical emergencies, as the things we talk about in there are going to start to formulate some of the things we talked about on the medical patient assessment. OK, so everything is going to start relating back to that medical or trauma assessment. OK. All right. If nobody has any more questions, uh, that's it for tonight. I appreciate it. Uh, like I said, go back, make sure you're reading your chapters and, and take your quizzes. All right. Y'all get caught up. All right. Appreciate you. all Have a good night. Good night. Night, night.